Muy bien, buenos días, buenos días a todos. Eh, bienvenidos a este acto y a esta nueva presentación del World Energy Outlook que tenemos hoy. Es el décimo año que se presenta aquí y se ha presentado hace tres días en Londres, ¿no? Y solo para los periodistas, o sea que vais a tener una oportunidad de conocerlo de primera mano, eh, las conclusiones del World Energy Outlook. Bien, eh, eh, vamos a tener una presentación, una, en este acto de presentación una introducción por parte de nuestro vicepresidente, Miguel, que es también nuestro patrocinador en este acto. Posteriormente, Laura Cochi, que ya lo ha hecho aquí hace dos años, me parece, aproximadamente, esta presentación nos lo hará y luego tendréis la oportunidad de hacerle las preguntas que os parezcan oportuno. Con lo cual, yo creo que siguiendo la puntualidad española, vamos a empezar eh, con el acto. Miguel, por favor. Muy buenos días, vicepresidenta de la Comisión Nacional de los Mercados y la Competencia, senadores, jefa del Departamento de Proyecciones de Demanda Energética de la Agencia Internacional de la Energía, autoridades, amigos del club, muy buenos días a todos. Quiero en primer lugar disculpar la presencia de Borja Prado, presidente de Enerclub, que por motivos de agenda de última hora pues no ha podido estar hoy con nosotros. Voy a decir unas breves palabras, ¿eh? espero cumplirlo, sobre cinco temas. Primero, en el club, el BUEO, la Unión Europea, España y algo de riesgo que hoy nos toca patrocinar. En el club es el centro de debate por excelencia en España. Y hoy es una de esas ocasiones en la que tenemos la presencia de una destacada personalidad que marca... Como en octubre empieza el año hidráulico, pues el año energético eh, en el mundo empieza cuando el World Energy Outlook, cuando la agencia publica sus, sus proyecciones y sus mejores estimaciones. Gracias por ser parte del club, por ser amigos y por pensar en el club siempre eh, como centro de debate, como centro de formación y como plataforma de comunicación para hacer la energía más conocida a todos nuestros consumidores. Os animamos a seguir siendo siempre muy amigos del club. El BUEO, nos decía nuestro director que cumple 40 años ¿eh? y eso es una... Eh, es felicidades ¿eh? por, esa, eh, por esa efeméride. Se presentó por primera vez en 1977 y este año, pues es solo hace tres días que se ha presentado en Londres y el, uno de los primeros sitios en el mundo donde se va a debatir es aquí hoy en España. Y tenemos el, la suerte de tener a Laura con nosotros, que es una, es una gran comunicadora, es una gran experta en la materia. Lleva trabajando en la agencia desde 1999. Ha trabajado en más de 20 ediciones del World Energy Outlook. Antes de estar en la agencia, tuvo su experiencia en, la, en el mundo de la empresa privada, en ENI, la gran empresa energética italiana. Tiene un máster en Ingeniería Medioambiental por el muy acreditado Politécnico de Milán y otro máster en Ciencias Económicas de la Energía y el Medio Ambiente. Many thanks, Laura, for having accepted our invitation and for being here with us in Madrid once again. And many thanks to the International Energy Agency for the confidence and trust put in Enerclub to present in Spain these and other relevant studies. El bueo ¿Y qué, qué nos va a desvelar? Eh? Yo no voy a decir qué iba a desvelar ella, eh? que tiene una presentación muy, muy clara, pero sí cuáles son los, los cuatro puntos que hacen cambiar el escenario energético mundial y que ellos destacan eh, entre las... Y el primero es la rapidez con la que están cayendo los costes de las energías renovables eh? y la penetración mucho más creciente de la que cualquiera podía haber anticipado. La segunda es la participación de la electrificación en la componente final de la energía. De hoy a los escenarios del 2040, el 40% del aumento del consumo energético va a venir de la electricidad. Estas son buenas noticias para compañías como aquella en la que yo trabajo. ¿no? Hay un cambio en, la, en China, un cambio en la orientación de su, de su Producto Interior Bruto mucho más orientado a los servicios y hacia eficiencia en todos los sentidos. Y eso tiene un gran impacto en cuál es el consumo final de energía. Y finalmente el rol de los Estados Unidos, ¿eh? que empieza a ser 
eh, con exceso de producción en gas y petróleo, un agente muy importante para todos. La Unión Europea, decía el, la semana pasada el comisario español Miguel Arias, dice que publicando apenas un, el último informe de cómo está avanzando la Unión Europea en materia de la lucha contra el cambio climático, la Unión Europea de 1990 a 2016 ha cortado sus emisiones un 23%. Bueno, eh, podrá ser suficiente o insuficiente, está en el camino. Lo importante es que en ese mismo periodo la economía ha crecido el 56%. Es decir, claramente se puede hacer ¿eh? y se puede incluso acelerar este desacoplamiento. La Unión Europea está comprometida con el Clean Energy Package, del que todos ¿eh? somos muy conocedores y hemos debatido en el club, y pronto tendremos que debatir, ¿eh? yo espero, también el nuevo paquete presentado la semana pasada de movilidad. Y tendremos que buscar una fecha, eh, querido director, ¿eh? Para, para hablar de, de esto. Decía también el, el comisario, ese crecimiento de las renovables es mucho más rápido, esa digitalización de la energía y esa conexión mayor entre electricidad y el sector del transporte. Pero hablaba de que la, la energía eh, eh, es también algo que puede hacer que mejore y se modernice el conjunto de la economía de la Unión Europea. Y eso es todavía más importante. Nos afecta no solo a los que estamos en esta sala, eh, sino a todos. En España tenemos una, eh, una agenda que yo creo que viene marcada por la Ley de, de Transición Energética y de Cambio Climático. Este es el, el gran compromiso que tiene España de sacar adelante. Y sobre esto, pues... Permítame algunos comentarios sobre cuáles podrían ser los, los principios rectores. Pensamos que debería de, pensar, de buscarse la eficacia, la eficiencia, la transparencia, la seguridad jurídica y simplicidad, la proporcionalidad, la sostenibilidad financiera y poner siempre al consumidor como elemento vertebrador de esta transición. Si hablamos de cómo, cuáles serían los principios rectores ¿eh? para conseguirlo, ¿eh? teniendo tantas fuerzas que tiran en, en distintas eh, direcciones, hablaríamos del consenso, la coordinación y una visión en la que tengamos una perspectiva de medio y de largo plazo, no de dónde nos aprieta el zapato a cada uno de nosotros en un día como hoy. Uno de esos eh, valores de los que hablamos es la transparencia. Eh, y agradezco a la vicepresidenta que esté aquí, también a todos los miembros del, del, del Gobierno, directores, ¿no? pero en la, en la página web, la primera visión que uno si entra en la CNMC, pues lo que dice es la CNMC promueve y defiende el buen funcionamiento de todos los mercados en interés de los consumidores y de las empresas. Y trabajamos por la transparencia. Yo creo que es muy importante ese mensaje de las empresas. Hoy aquí hay muchas empresas... Ponemos al consumidor en el centro, pero como decía el comisario europeo, las empresas, la modernización de la industria y de la economía es vital. ¿Eh? Tenemos que tener eso en cuenta también. Eh, ese, esa componente de la electricidad, ¿eh? que es la que va a absorber el 40% del crecimiento de la demanda energética, eh, pues va a sustituir el mismo porcentaje de crecimiento de la energía que en los últimos 25 años ocupó el petróleo. Esto es, eh, y bienvenidos los que estáis en el mundo del petróleo aquí, que también estáis viviendo una transformación, como los del sector eléctrico, pero fijaros eh, que pasamos de esa dominancia del petróleo eh, durante 25 años absorbiendo todo ese 40% a que sea la electricidad. Entonces la electricidad pues es un gran producto, por lo tanto, una, una gran industria en la, que, en la que trabajar. Yo creo que tiene un, un futuro brillante por delante. Necesita muchas inversiones para descarbonizarla, para descentralizarla, para digitalizarla, para darles a esos clientes lo que nos piden, que es una experiencia diferente, más moderna. Y ahí, pues permitidme terminar solo con algún compromiso de riesgo para también responder a eh, a esos retos, 
nos apoyamos pues, en cuatro pilares, en la tecnología, como la gran aliada, en ofrecer siempre una experiencia a la medida a nuestros clientes, en tratar de hacer las cosas de una forma simple y transparente y para empoderar al consumidor, que es lo que él hoy demanda en todas y cada una de las actividades de su vida. Si hacemos esto en Viesgo y en todas las demás empresas que estamos aquí, pues yo creo que haremos compañías más atractivas para atraer el talento que necesitamos para transformar esta industria y también seremos capaces de cumplir con los retos que demanda el consumidor del futuro. Muchas gracias, Laura. Tienes la palabra. So, good morning, everyone. It's a big, big pleasure to be back in, uh, in Madrid, and a huge thank you to uh, Club Español de la Energía, the only words in Spanish that I will try to say today. <laughs> Ten years here, it's, a, it's really a great honor in bringing together uh, everyone that uh, matters in the energy world in, in Spain. It's a really big privilege for me to be here with you, with you today. Um, Miguel mentioned that it's 40 years that we celebrate this year on the World Energy Outlook. I haven't done quite all the editions, but I've done many of them. And sometimes people tell me, are you not bored of doing, again, understanding projections over the next 25 years? Are you finding it interesting again? And let me tell you something. It's probably the most beautiful job on the planet. One thing only. I was making this observation two, two days ago. When we were doing this book, uh, I felt a bit more or less the same as the day before yesterday when we found out that Italy <coughs> was out of the World Cup, meaning you should never take anything for granted. <laughs> so this is the summary of this World Energy Outlook. Don't take anything for granted, even if you've been in this business for many, many years. So we are seeing, uh, Miguel mentioned this already, four big, big changes. First of all, the United States. The United States is becoming the largest oil and gas producer in the world. What does that mean? They are producing more oil than Saudi Arabia, more gas than Russia, and this is not only now, it will be for the next 25 years ahead. From the United States alone will come 80%, 80%, of incremental oil demand over the next 10 years. So here you have a super giant that is changing the way it's influencing global energy markets. Second, clean energy technologies. What we have seen in the clean energy technology space is incredible. The cost reduction that was pushed very much by policy frameworks, it's crazy. There is no other way to, to mention it. We always talk about solar PV. What you've seen in the solar PV space is, is incredible. Wind, very similar. Wind offshore coming very so strongly. What we don't mention much is what's happening in the digital space with sensors, for example, that are now not 80, not 85, 95% cheaper than they were 10 years ago. It means that if you're owning a power plant, putting a sensors on, to check how good is functioning, costs you nothing, but saves you a lot of money in terms of predicting maintenance. So you're having assets that live much longer and that they can talk to each other. Third, China. I will come back to that in a second. You have all followed President Xi address to the party. What he announced is very clear. He announced a new era for China, new challenges, new opportunities. We are seeing very clearly the changes in the energy sector already. And this is going to change again the face of the energy world as we know it. You are all looking at China when you look at uh, uh, energy trends. You need to start looking at different indicators. Over the past three days, we have had a lot of press coverage. Most of it, to be very honest, was about the US becoming 
the undisputed leader of oil and gas. If you ask me, what is the big story of this year outlook is electricity. And we'll come back to that again. So all in all, what does it mean? There are good news because energy overall is becoming more affordable. So if you go back to the consumers, this is a very good news for consumers, affordability. However, the way we think about uh, energy security is changing. Digitalization and cybersecurity are becoming very much at the center of concerns. And natural gas and the way the flexibility in systems is operating is also becoming extremely crucial. Those were preoccupations that we didn't have very high on the agenda and should become mainstream and will become mainstream going forward. So we, we many of you are aficionados, so you know that we do projections. We don't do forecasts, right? <laughs> so we, are not, we don't have crystal ball that tells us uh, how the future is gonna be, especially not in 25 years. So very humbly, we do analysis with models and we try to understand what happens if policies are the one that we know today and technology trends are the one that we know today. So this is what I'm gonna explain you now. I go back to what I said at the beginning, Italy not uh, entering the World Cup. Now here is like you're going to see a play and you think that the characters uh, have a script that you know very well. So you're expecting to see certain things. And actually, everything is scrambled. You have many, many surprises. And the characters are doing something very different. First of all, we are all expecting to see China as the largest energy demand growth, and in fact, is India. India alone taking 30%, 30% of global incremental demand growth. One country accounts for the next 30%. Why India? India today has one-fifth of energy use than developed countries. It's adding 300 million people, 300 million people to its population in 25 years. And importantly, this administration, Prime Minister Modi, is taking the energy sector very seriously and putting in place reforms that are moving the things in a very, very fast way. They are well on track to give access to the 240 million today that don't have it, to all of them by 2020. Huge opportunities in India, huge demand growth. China, I'll come back to this in a second, it's still huge, still huge, but it's not huge in the fuels you would expect China to be huge. So, another surprise. Africa. We all have in mind Africa being the place where, if I ask all of you, you will say, yeah, it's the place where two out of three people don't have access to electricity, and we stop there. If you want to see a place in the planet where there is a lot of innovation happening in the energy sector, it's Africa. You have incredible rollouts in the millions of new business models where you roll out small solar PV with super efficient appliances being monitored somewhere either in Delhi or in Europe and in every moment I know what this household is consuming and is paid with digital finance. A new business model, small, I'm not selling electricity, I'm selling a package with a service. What does the household need and I'm selling that. What does it mean? This has meant that the two countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, they are well on track to give access to everyone by 2030. Another turnaround, Middle East. If I ask you what do you want to know about the Middle East today, you say, okay, Saudi Arabia, the place where you want to be if you need, uh, need oil, Qatar, if you need LNG. Well, Middle East, is gonna become the second largest region in terms of consumption, not production, for gas. Consumption, not production, for natural gas. And for oil, the third largest consuming region within 10 years, just after China, the United States, the largest consuming region in the world for oil is gonna be the Middle East. So when you look at the Middle East, 
don't only look production numbers, look more and more consumption as well. Finally, the United States, probably one of the largest turnaround in energy history, a country that was the largest importer of oil, largest importer of gas, super giant in terms of consumption, that well before 2030 is on track to start exporting oil, becoming a net oil exporter. LNG exports have already started this year. This is a tremendous transformation in energy geopolitics. So we are adding overall growth in primary energy demand of 30% from now to 2040. India the largest. Which fuels are we going to use the most? So. 85% of incremental demand growth is going to be from two groups. One is low carbon technologies, big winners here, solar and wind, and natural gas. So low carbon technologies are accounting for half of the growth and natural gas for 35% of the growth. Who is driving this huge transformation? Who is driving it? It's China. China that we used to know for the place that is using a lot of incremental coal. What's happening? Everything is changing. Why? Well, there are two pillars of this. One is what's happening in the economy, and the second is what's happening in the energy sector. What's happening in the economy? So you have a huge country of 1.3 billion people that is more or less stable. Demographics are very flat in China. So you have a population that is getting richer, is getting richer fast, and is getting older. So all of us, you get richer and older, what do you want? You consume more. You want more. You go from more quality. You want more quality, which means that a lot of the economic growth that before was just happening because of exports can happen because of consumption of these new, richer families. To produce one dollar of value added in China with the current structure, you need 12 units of energy, 12 units to produce one dollar of growth. If you go to the service sector, and with this I mean what the families, what the Chinese family want today, is one unit of energy for one unit of economic growth. Is a factor 10. So our expectation today, with this huge change in the economy, is that China has been growing 8% per year over the past 25 years. It's going to slow down tremendously to 1%. 8%, 1%. It's a tremendous transformation. But don't forget, this is a move towards quality. So coal for us in steel, cement, it has peaked structurally. It may go up in certain years for uh, you have rollout of constructions happening and it's okay. Power generation flattish until the 2030 and then going down. Oil. Still a mainstay of oil market until 2030. But post 2030, we see oil demand in China flat. Why? Transport needs are going to go down. Why is that? Huge transformation in cities, tremendous rollout of electric vehicles, with China wanting to become a major global leader in electric vehicles. Huge push for efficiency. And why is that? Because people don't want to live anymore in polluted cities. They have the information now. They are demanding their leaders to act. How does this action turn? It turns into growth in natural gas. Natural gas it is displacing some of the coal and a huge growth in low carbon technologies. In these low carbon technologies, if you go out of this meeting and you want to remember two or three things, 
maybe one of those things that you need to remember is the following. Maybe not. <laughs> In December last year, so December 2016, you had the uh, writing down the name of this new law, which is called the New Energy Production and Consumption Revolution. Now, if the Chinese call something a revolution, they know what they're talking about. It's not by any coincidence that this is called a revolution. And this is a revolution that is mostly happening in the power sector. Today, China produces electricity. 67% of that electricity is coal-based. Before 2030, before 2030, so in the next 10 years, electricity generated by low carbon renewables is gonna be larger than the one produced from coal. If you imagine the power sector of China, you can imagine what are the sheer investments that are gonna happen in this sector. And we stay with the, with the power sector for, for one second. We go at the global level again. Huge transformation. Coal, we have around 200 gigawatts of coal being built today as we speak. There are 200 gigawatts that are being built globally. After this wave of, wave of 200 giga gigawatts has been built, the additions of coal are really crawling down to a very small number, around 10 gigawatts a year. This is mostly Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan, Vietnam, and most of, the, of it is not the very, very inefficient coal. It's more efficient coal, which leads to a flattening of global coal demand for power. Flattening of global coal demand for power. Gas turbines for us is still a healthy business, but it's a very difficult business. Increasingly a difficult business. It's not the same business that the gas turbines were doing before. Those are gas turbines that are used much more for flexibility, up and down, to be good husbands of renewables. So those power plants that behave well vis-a-vis -vis giving the right flexibility to the systems to accompany renewables are the ones that are winning. Competition is extremely, extremely harsh. Competition vis-a-vis -vis the alternative, being uh, solar, being wind, it's becoming tougher and tougher in all markets. Nuclear is also growing. Again, this is very much a China story. China is adding a lot of nu nuclear capacity today, and interestingly, this is not technology that has been imported. This is technology, new technology, call it new technology or uh, slightly modified old technology <laughs> that is anyway Chinese branded, that they're trying to export in other places in Asia. So another big place where China wants to enter and wants to enter strongly. There's not much to tell here. The story is very clear. New so the, what coal was to the electricity sector over the past decade, solar will be in terms of capacity over the next 25 years. Why is that? Is because of the tremendous cost declines. In China, new solar is becoming cheaper than coal by 2030, and in India, already by the early 2020s. And if you look where demand is coming from, India is gonna add, in terms of electricity demand, the equivalent of Europe today, a huge market, huge market, and China, is gonna add the equivalent of the United States today. This is electricity, this is the shift from quantity to quality that we were talking about earlier. Electricity, unlike other fuels, is growing also in developed countries, and the drivers of growth are surprising, and some of that not so surprising. First, digitalization. 
your kids are always attached to the tablets, my kids too. I am always attached to my mobile phone. We are using an incredible amount of new data on a daily basis, and this requires energy and requires electricity. And importantly, electricity in our countries is challenging domains that were of fossil fuels only before. There were domains that were considered mobility, heating needs, where fossil fuel only space you had. Electricity doesn't come here. This is being challenged very much so. So that if primary energy demand grows 30%, electricity demand grows twice as fast, 60%. So the big question is, is electricity becoming the new oil? And there are some indications that would point in that direction. One of which is that last year we looked country by country. Expenditures of us families as businesses together. And for the first time in history, the amount of money that we consumers spent on electricity approached that in oil products. Now, clearly, low oil prices played a role. But if you look at the trends, they're very clear. Electricity expenditures are on a marching trend up with no blips whatsoever seen over the past 25 years. Where is demand coming from in terms of sectors? There are some that we never hear about. Industrial motors are really the key. So if you want to understand what's happening on electricity demand, and if you are in the developing world, still in China, in India, what matters is what matters to industrial motors. Cooling is another incredibly fast increasing needs. Why? Because most of the increasing population, we are around 70, 7 billion today, we increased to 9 billion. Most of these new people are actually going to live in cities and in warm cities. They, were, they want air conditioning. So if you look at China and India, demand of air conditioning combined, in 2040, is going to be equal to half of electricity demand of Europe today. It's a huge number, huge number. And the others we already spoke about is the connected devices, is the appliances, and it's electric vehicles. Now, electric vehicles, probably many of you, if I hadn't shown this chart before, you would have thought that that part could have been probably a bit, a bit larger. For the time being, it's not so large. So let's continue with the with electric vehicle. So today, there are around two million electric vehicle, two million circulating on the planet, the global car stock is one billion. So one billion cars, two millions are electric. The push behind electric vehicles is enormous. Cities from London to Dubai, countries, France, the UK, China, India most recently, wanting to electrify all by 2030, companies, over the past year, we've seen nearly all car manufacturers wanting to put up a new electric vehicle model. So there is a big, big wind behind electric vehicles. Our expectation is that, uh, having looked at uh, all the car manufacturers' uh, uh, intentions with some grain of salt and policy push, this is gonna be a huge growth market, around 50 million by 2025. So in 10 years' time, and nearing 300 million by 2040. By that time, the global car stock would have doubled to 2 billion. So you're talking about around probably 15% of the global, global car stock is going to be electric, where a lot in China, in Europe, some in India, some in the United States. So why are we doing electric vehicles in the first place? We are doing electric vehicles mostly for local pollution reasons. So it's really a policy drive. The cities that want to get grapple with local pollution issues are pushing the electric vehicle segment. Now, electric cars, when you, once you get the battery right, they're pretty easy to build. It's not the same business as building a combustion engine. 
Why am I saying this? Because this is going to be a big battleground between China, Europe, and the United States. Who is going to get there first is going to get a huge price. Does it make huge differences in terms of oil demand and CO2 emissions? So first, let me go with CO2 emissions. Our analysis shows that 300 million electric cars, they cut 1%, 1% of CO2 emissions. Not huge. What about oil demand? So for us, the segment of passenger oil demand will slow down in the early 2020s and start declining post-2025, so that you see actually a peak and a decline in this segment. Many commentators stop here and say oil demand is going to peak. Well, we agree for buildings and power generation. We don't agree globally. There are huge demand growth areas in transport outside the passenger vehicle segment. So freight, trucks, huge growth, especially in Asia. Aviation and shipping, huge growth, despite the IMO regulation, etc. And petrochemicals for us becomes the largest growth segment for oil. Why petrochemicals? So petrochemicals is again us. It's not something that is very remote from us. So as European, we consume around 100 kilos of plastic per year. 100 kilos of plastic per year. What is that? Is plastic bags, is your toothbrush, the Lego toys, uh, it's everywhere. Even your car, even if you've bought an electric car, 50% of that car is made of plastic. So you may not want to use oil to fuel your car, but still you have used the oil to build your car. So these 100 kilos that we are consuming here, in Southeast Asia, where most of the growth is coming, is less than half of that. So the scope for increase is huge, and the population increase is huge. So this is where the growth is going to come from. And where is this oil coming from? So let's go to the US story. What has happened in the US is pretty clear. Uh, for nearly 30 years, uh, US was managing a slowly declining oil and gas production with investments that were keeping uh, the oil and gas industry pretty happy, but in slow but sure decline. Then in 2008, one of the things that we said right already 10 years ago, we said a silent revolution is happening. And the silent revolution was that instead of continuing to see this decline, the tremendous advances in technology, technology is one of the things that Miguel mentioned earlier. We always talk technology about renewables, etc. but what has happened in the oil and gas industry is tremendous in terms of technology innovation. What has happened is that the decline started to show an uptick. So the oil and gas industry in the United States started to be healthy. And we started observing that. A lot of us with a bit of cautiousness said, ah, the moment the price crash, they will all go out of business. Well, they're still all there in business. And this is what you're expecting going forward. If these numbers don't tell you much, this means that in 15 years, the US will have ramped up oil production more than the Saudis have when they were de developing their Gawar field. The Gawar field is the largest oil field ever known in human history. The ramp up in gas production that the US will do is larger than what the Russians have done in West Siberia when they developed natural gas, mostly for Europe. It's something, if you want to call it spectacular, is the only word that really comes to my mind. It, an incredible thing that is happening in the United States. The dimensions of which are really mind-boggling. What does it mean for the US? First of all, there are implications for gas markets, and I'll come back to that, because the US coming into the gas markets and exporting LNG is changing the rules of the game for natural gas. 
But for oil markets, the geopolitics of oil are going to look very, very different. You imagine a country that has been reliant on Middle East oil for decades, that has written a lot of uh, energy history on this. As of the early end of 2020s, sitting in a very favorable position where they find themselves in a net exporting situation. We don't know of any other major country that managed to turn its position upside down from a major net importer to a net exporter. Are they going to be huge numbers? No. The Middle East is going to remain key for export to Asia. We are not saying that the Middle East is not going to become and remain fundamental to the oil markets generally, but in geopolitics, this has huge implications. What's happening to natural gas? Most of the international trade in natural gas is today happening via pipe. And this is one of the things that is going to reverse in the future. So natural gas is going to grow a lot, a very healthy growth, the healthier growth among fossil fuels. Most of it is going to be exchanged through LNG in a liquefied form, in a form that resembles more and more oil, more and more oil, more liquid. A lot of the new built in LNG liquefaction capacity are actually happening without having contracted all the gas. Why is that? Because more and more the constructor people are happy to take the risk and they think that as much as half of the capacity they will be able to sell on spot markets. So a big shake-up in the way we used to do long-term contracts for, for gas. A lot of renegotiation happening because this market is going to remain well supplied in the years ahead. But if you see who is exporting today and the quantity of the future, well, you're looking at a pretty different configuration. You look at how huge US and Canada look like. The interesting thing is that today is mostly Canada in that red box, and in the future is mostly US in that red box. Africa is mostly West Africa. And for us Europeans, it doesn't matter so much. But for Asia, what's happening in Australia, it's a revolution in itself. Who is buying this gas? We Europeans remain a very important importer, but a lot of competition more and more from Asian buyers. Which Asian buyers? Usual some of the usual suspects. Japan and Korea. China, huge coming in, and a lot of other smaller Asian customers coming very heavily into this market. So this is the world that today we think would look like uh, in 25 years' time with the policies that we have uh, implemented, that we are currently considering, and the technology cost reduction. Are we happy with this world? Uh, they say that delusions provide solutions. Why delusions? There are certainly three areas in which this world fails. This world fails in meeting the Paris Agreement, CO2 emissions, despite all this good news, despite all this tremendous investment in solar and wind that I've shown earlier, despite this tremendous increase in gas, CO2 emissions still go up. So we failed to meet the Paris Agreement. Second, there would still be 700 million people, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa, without access to electricity. Frankly speaking, crazy to think that. And third, Despite this, pollution in many cities, including our cities, is going to worsen. I don't know if you're following what's happening in Delhi. Probably you are in terms of uh, pollution crisis. So in Delhi, for nearly a week now, uh, the level of pollution is high. But how much high is that? So you know that the measurement that you also have in Madrid, there are in many places in Europe, you mentioned the concentration of particulate matter that is the one that is very dangerous for lungs and for heart problems. 
those measurements are very standard. Huh? We, we produce them in, uh, and roll them out everywhere in the same way. And those measurements are high and heating in all the, the, the stations in Delhi. They're showing 999. So newspapers started saying, we reached 999. But the reason is that the human mind could not think that in a city we could have above 1,000 of micrograms of particulate matter. So we, are, we don't know how much pollution there is in Delhi today. We just know that it's beyond what we thought could have been achieved and measured just a few years ago. So it's completely crazy. And with this scenario, you are improving, but not so much. So what we did for the first time is asked ourselves, OK, what do we need to do better? And what are the levers that we would need to change if, by 2040, you want to achieve those three goals that are, frankly speaking, very uh, a must. There is no other word to, to say that. So putting together, addressing climate change, achieving universal access, and improve air quality in cities. Those are the CO2 emissions that uh, we foresee uh, in, the, in our main scenario. And this is where they should, the way they should look like if you want to comply with the Paris Agreement, what's being negotiated today in Bonn as last day. And there are a few actions that would need to be pushed further. First is efficiency. We will need to push efficiency first, twice as much as what we are doing now. This means LEDs, which are not many around here. <laughs> and it means all those sorts of uh, smaller things that we use in our daily life. Huh? It's a world where you need more natural gas than today. And this is important because many people think that uh, a world that is compliant with Paris doesn't have fossil fuels anymore. This is not true. A world that is compliant with Paris continues to use fossil fuels and in particular continues to use gas. Does it continue to use gas exactly the same way as we do today? Not necessarily. I think that there are things the gas industry can do and we are encouraging the gas industry to do, notably on venting and flaring. But this is a world where gas has a place. Gas has a place in all of our scenarios. It's a world where you push carbon technologies even more. So you need to go even more on solar, on wind. Wind in Europe that is expected to be the largest source of electricity generation already in our main scenario by 2030 would even have a larger role. And going back to the electric vehicle, you need to multiply by three the number that we said earlier. So we are in a way doing all of the right things it's just a matter of accelerating all of them. How much does it cost? So our main scenario costs overall 60 trillion. 60 trillion is for everything, is for producing oil and gas, but is also for our daily expenditures on buying the new car that is more efficient, etc. This new scenario would require an extra investment of 15% with all of the benefits that I let you judge by yourself whether it's a good policy choice or not. So we conclude, five points for you to remember. Remember the United States, but I think that you wouldn't forget it anyway. So larger than Saudi Arabia, larger than Russia for the next 25 years. Changing the dynamics completely of global geopolitics. Natural gas, the fossil fuel that we see growing in all scenarios, but is not an easy life. It's not an easy life if you are in the gas business. Pricing will matter to compete in Asian markets. So being able to be at low prices is one. And the second, having what we call license to operate, proving the sustainability also on the full cycle on emissions. China, continue to look at China but keep in mind that this is a new China. This is not the China that we used to know a couple of years ago. So expand the horizons in terms of what indicators you look. Include smart grids in it, include digital technologies, include electric vehicles. And I wouldn't be surprised if we start looking also about carbon capture use and storage in, in China ahead of uh, some of us. Finally, if we want to achieve 
more sustainability at large. We are doing the right things. We just need to accelerate them. And I conclude with the, I, what I personally believe is probably one of the key and strongest messages that will shake up uh, the energy business going forward is the marriage between electrification and digitalization that we are seeing. We are just at the beginning of this revolution. Look and watch out for that because this can roll out very, very fast and change also the game in the electricity business. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. This was an outstanding presentation this year, as always. Uh, this is a moment we can start with the Q and A session. If there are somebody who will ask you, or you are uh, talking less this year about the oil and about the nuclear, no? All this, all the years we were talking more in the report about this, no? right? So um, nuclear, questions. nuclear apart from uh, from China is not having a very very easy life, yeah. to be honest. Uh, the high cost of capital. Uh, is, uh, is being very challenging from nuclear, but I have to say that high capex projects have been challenged throughout the energy industry, but nuclear is the one that probably has suffered the most. Uh, and in markets which are competitive, low natural gas prices have also made the life very, very difficult for, for nuclear. Okay, questions, uh, please. Por favor. Uh, presentaros eh, al hacer la pregunta. Hello, this is Elisa Prieto from Acciona. Uh, thank you. It was a very clear, very good presentation. I actually have two questions. So the first question is, um, when I read this kind of books, I usually find more information about batteries. I don't think you mentioned or you mentioned very briefly. So my first question is, why not more mentioning uh, batteries. And the second question is, actually you mentioned during your presentation that solar was getting cheaper and cheaper and you forecast that by 2030 it will actually be cheaper than coal in places like uh, India or China. So that to me is curious when I compare to how you expect the net, the net capacity additions to be every year from solar, which are constant. I mean, if the prices decline in such a way, I would expect the net additions yearly to grow a little bit. So thank you, those are my two questions. Okay. So batteries, what you're seeing in batteries is, uh, uh, in terms of cost reduction is, uh, is impressive, very, very impressive. We are expecting uh, uh, cost reduction in batteries to continue. And if we take the example of batteries for cars, which are really the ones that are driving down R&D costs for all other applications. So what's happening in the automotive industry uh, is basically what you would expect also to then reflect into, uh, into batteries storage in, in other places. We are expecting actually to reach the floor cost, which is now spoken by Tesla and many others of the 100 kilowatts, $100 per kilowatts by 2025. So it's, uh, uh, it's coming, it's coming pretty soon. We have analyzed if with those uh, costs, uh, does battery revolutionize the car industry on one hand, and the way we understand uh, the electricity industry with, with, with huge storage. On cars, uh, you reach cost, cost competitiveness with the uh, conventional cars a bit later, and in markets where you have high taxes on ga gasoline and you don't drive very long ranges. So we are not there yet to say this uh, will happen only on economic grounds. Even when you reach this 100 kilowatts, uh, dollars per, hundred dollars per kilowatt. And on the electricity side, so why do we need storage? We need storage to uh, provide more renewables and variable renewables into systems. And our analysis shows that there is a huge potential that we are not using on demand side responses, huge. What do I mean with this huge is the following. We're all having uh, water heaters at home. All of us are using heating. And what digitalization with the smart thermostat can potentially do is the same thing 
that Airbnb has done with the hotel industries. Let me explain better. We suddenly found out that we had a spare room that has a value. We didn't know it before. Now, with the smart thermostats and digitalization, you actually find out that you have some capacity in your home that might have a value. But you need the regulators to price that value. Now, digital technology could unlock this, and we find that actually if you were able to unlock these demand-side responses, you could have a huge amount of new renewables coming in, even before battery storage costs go down. On the flat additions, the flat additions is, uh, um, unfortunately, a lot of this presentation was just showing differences between now and 2040, but trends tend to flatten out in huge markets pretty quickly. So China today is adding half of the global additions in terms of solar. The moment you have a flattening or a slowing down of electricity demand in China, you don't find very easily another China to add the equivalent of solar. Hello, my name is Jose Manuel Marco. I come from DMVGL, which is a technical advisor in energy and other things. Uh, well, my, my question was uh, related about the storage. Sorry to come back uh, on this. Um, I always uh, thought, or in our company, we thought that yeah. such relevant growth in solar was only I wouldn't say only, but uh, it will imply uh, a strong uh, combination with storage. And you you barely mention it. You mention it a bit now after the question. But uh, could you please elaborate a bit more on on the importance of storage in this context uh, for the future of solar? Thank you. So. For the levels that we are seeing here of, uh, uh, of solar, so overall electricity generation from renewables reaches 40% uh, and solar reaches around 10% by 2040. With those levels, uh, uh, of course, in certain markets like Europe, like China and others, this share is higher, but storage doesn't make a huge difference. Uh, let me explain better. What you need is flexibility is flexibility in a system. And the flexibility can be provided in many different ways. It can be provided with transmission and distribution lines. It can be provided by gas. And we think that gas is going to remain the cheapest form of providing flexibility for systems, certainly at those levels of uh, solar penetration for quite some time. You need to have market reforms and get remuneration for whatever energy you're producing, in this case is electricity, plus something else, some other form of remuneration. If you put a CCGT and a battery on the same market, and you take the battery cost, the floor cost, still for quite some time, the extra money that the CCGT would get, would need to get in revenues, is much smaller than the battery cost. So, Surely, in a world where you want to have a lot more renewables, storage is going to be key, key, but not yet at these levels. This is Alvaro Mazarraza from the Oil uh, Downstream Spanish Association. Thank you very much, Laura, for your inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, first, I have a question is regarding the decision announced by uh, yesterday by the Norwegian sovereign fund, the, the biggest sovereign fund in the world, that questioned the probably investments in the oil and gas stocks and invest from the, the huge positions they have already have. No? As you made in your presentation, the revolution of the unconventional uh, oil and gas in the States was not funded by uh, sovereign funds, was funded by hedge funds, uh, venture capital, uh, so there is no lack of money to, to put money in the oil industry and gas industry that is still, as you said, is needed because we will need uh, 12 uh, million barrels per day in 2040. What is your opinion on, uh, about the, uh, the financing of, of the needed uh, investors to continue to supply 112 uh, million barrels of, of uh, oil in, in, in 2040? 
And the second is a, a small statement, just uh, to clarify that our members uh, are energy suppliers and electrification is, is there, it's clear that, the, that this is the future. I'm pretty sure that an, indu an industry with a long uh, uh, history of supplying energy will be there in the future and will be key players in supplying electricity and, and perhaps adding uh, competitiveness because we are a very competitive industry and uh, a message to my great friend Miguel, I'm sure our companies will be uh, supplying the energy they will need in 2040. So there is no shortage of capital. It's very easy. There is no shortage of, of capital. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very clear. Um, I will not comment on the decision of the fund. They, of course, they, uh, they are sovereign and they decide what to do on their own. However, I would like to say another thing, which is the following. There has been a lot of discussion about stopping financing uh, the oil and gas industry because this is not compatible with the two degree, two degree trajectory. This is simply factually wrong. Even in our two degrees compatible scenario, we do see an increase in investment in oil and more so in gas. Why is that? You that are in the business, you all know it. 80% of the oil investments are needed, not because the demand is increasing, but to keep the production flat. So if you look, you've done analysis that show, if you look at how much the production would go down if you stop investing, and how much a two degree compatible demand looks like, you have a huge gap. You have a huge gap. So the uh, big message of stop investing may actually lead us to a shortfall in investment that would create a price spike. Laura, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. I'm Antonio Merino. I'm the chief economist at, at Repsol. I think we met before. Firstly, I would like to, to point it out that uh, this is a scenario. So my first question is, the new policy is a scenario. For this time, I don't see this scenario as the nationally determined committed contribution. It goes beyond. What I'm saying is you are changing what is the central scenario. And most people will follow, well, this is the central scenario and this is what is the most uh, probable scenario. So first thing, to what extent what you are presenting today as uh, the National Policy Center goes beyond what is absolute, what was before this scenario. So it's, it's more demanding than what is uh, forecast or embedded in the, in the national contribution. Secondly, I would like to have something else in your, in your book, and you know what, solar. Put very clearly to what extent the marginal price of solar is in China and analyze to what extent the price of solar as, and I will refer afterwards to the price of shale, is linked to national policies, like in the iron industry. So I'm not going to talk uh, about uh, an associate member of the institution that I respect so much uh, in terms of dumping, but to what extent this is economically sustainable decrease in price in the solar industry in China, which make me also think about shale. It is not that there is no capital, it's that there is so much capital that this is absolutely a bubble. Yesterday, they published 24 shale companies, Thai Toil, Carbonate Sun, whatever you make, none of them but one is free cash flow positive. None of them is, this is in the case of, of oil. So I expect oil demand going up and the price a little bit uh, harder. And the last one, which is more a reflection. I would like to see gas as the transition fuel. I think there are other guys here who will be more interested than, than I. I'm only 25% I think interested, Manolo. But the question is, to what extent it makes sense to go from carbon to create all the things that we need for infrastructure for gas and then go for solar? Let's go from carbon to, uh, to solar, and, and this is the case. But if you want to go for gas, and if I see your, your scenario, it seems to me that to have that much gas, 
if there is a, a budgetary restriction for the companies, we need higher prices. To what extent? I know that it's in, it is absolutely explained in your, in your document, but I have doubt how it's possible to have so much gas that we will need in your national policy scenario at these prices. Sorry for taking so much time, but uh, thank you again. So NDCs, NDCs and what is included in uh, our new policy scenario. Uh, very much depends where you are in the following way. For the US, is much less ambitious than the NDC because they don't have it anymore. If you are in China, it is more ambitious than what they have in the NDC. Why? Because the documents that they're publishing, and when the Chinese publish a document, is because they know not only that they're going to reach the target, but they're going to overachieve it, is already a year after they signed Paris, is significantly more ambitious than before. So they reflect the NDCs as much as the governments have changed or not changed their position compared compared to Paris. So, but have those two players in mind, basically. They, they are the ones that change the global picture. The second question is about uh, how much uh, of the solar is related to uh, unsustained, uh, let's say, unsustained policies or subsidies. It's very simple. Last year, uh, of the, all the solar additions uh, uh, that were done, over 90% had a form of regulated environment, you want to call it. In some cases, there are is subsidies. In most cases, is, is auctions, but auctions that go with a lot of strings attached to it, which is a form of not full, uh, full competition. What, what was the role of China in declining costs? I don't think that China did the big work in declining costs. What European government have done in terms of declining costs mattered for nearly 80% of the cost reduction we have seen in the past 10 years. We have done the heavy work. What China has done is take it from that point and make it mass. Now, if I have an advice to give to Europeans is watch out what's happening in the EV sector. The third point on, uh, on gas and the compatibility with, the, uh, with climate we have done an analysis and showed it even before, before the, WIO, uh, the WIO came out. Where is the place for gas in a climate-constrained world? It is in all those places we are, we are replacing with coal because the life cycle analysis is very clear vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis gas. And in many cases, when you are competing against oil, I take the example of shipping industry. When you're going from heavy fuel oil to natural gas LNG, you're saving emissions. It's not going to be an easy business. And I completely agree with you that in certain areas of the world where ramp up of uh, um, renewables is going up very strongly, the case for natural gas is going to be very tough. And it's up to the industry to see whether they are able to compete at low prices. This is, for me, a valid question mark. Yes, hello. Good morning. My name is Carlos from Repsol. And thank you very much for your presentation, Laura. Uh, my question is, uh, what, what is your opinion about the role of biofuels in Europe? Uh, uh, the quotas or obligation for member states and refineries like us will be disappear in 2040? Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> 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 I think. What I, so what I think is that at a certain point, so we are in a phase where um, improvement in combustion engines, uh, blending with biofuels, and electric vehicle are all being hand in hand. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, at a certain point in time, it's not going to be so obvious that they're gonna, we are going to be all friends. At a certain point, I think there's going to be one option that is going to be much favored compared to the others. And maybe uh, the blending mandates or others will, uh, uh, will suffer. Now, what we can achieve, it very much depends what is the ultimate objective of the policymaker. If the ultimate objective of the policymaker is maintaining uh, 
import bees at certain levels. Uh, improvement in uh, combustion engine with biofuels are the cheapest and most economic way going forward for some days ahead. Okay, the last question, please. Pedro Linares from Comillas University. Thank you, Laura, for the excellent presentation. Uh, two very specific questions that raised uh, uh, that your presentation raised. One, I was a, a bit intrigued by your projection, not forecast, on uh, the role that electric vehicles will play in India. Um, you, you basically show that China is going to be the leader, and the U.S. and and Europe, but India is going to be uh, a small chunk in that. I was a bit surprised because basically in India you have a lot of manufacturers that can play a very interesting role in that. You have the air pollution problem. You have the huge amount of population that are willing to go into it. Is this an issue of income or why are you constraining so much or not expecting that much growth in EV in, in India? And then I have a second small question which is, uh, which can be very long also. Uh, what are the implications of this new scenario that you paint uh, about oil demand and about the increase in shipping and aviation and for oil refining? Because the, the question that rises is, how will that affect the balance of oil refining? Uh, if we are losing high-end products and if we're going for low-end products, how will oil refining cope with that? Thank you. So, India. Um, First of all, what the government has put forward for the time being is pretty vague. In the sense that there is an intention of going all electric to 2030. And the concrete thing that they have done is putting forward a bid now for, um, for, national, for, for government's uh, uh, cars. We are probably talking about 15,000 to 20,000 vehicles. It can ramp up, it can ramp up very quickly. From our point of view, the constraint today is on the grid. The electricity grid in India is not great. So the moment they start fixing very clearly the problems on the grid and they put up the capacity on the manufacturing side, it can scale up and is certainly one of the places in the world where it can scale up very, very quickly. We are always talking about electric vehicles full stop. Let's not forget that the emerging world Today, you move still much more yourself through electric bikes or motorbikes than cars. And this is the area where we do believe India will move and charge ahead very fast. For refiners, I have just one, uh, one very quick uh, question. It's gonna be a very difficult time ahead and it's gonna be even more so going forward because Middle East and China are taking a very clear, very aggressive position there. So it's not gonna be easy business at all. Okay, thank you very much, Laura, and applause for her. Thank you.